Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to our expert roundtable discussion, which is hosted by the British Chamber of Commerce in Germany, the BCCG. My name is Alex Oldman. I'm one of the chairmen of the BCCG, and I'm delighted today to partner this event with the Timber Trade Federation in the UK, the TTF, for a discussion about engineered timber as a safe and long-term solution for sustainable house building. Ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to give you a couple of notes of our format today. First, we'll hear some short opening comments from our panelists, who will be introduced by Richard Ogden, our moderator for today. Richard is then going to ask the panelists various questions on the topic. Both questions ask in advance and your live questions here today. And then we will close promptly at 12 p.m. UK time or 1 p.m. German time. For our live questions today, please use the chat function, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That will enable us to see your questions and we will try and ensure we will get these all answered today. Just to let you know, we will also be recording today's session as there are many members of the BCCG, the TTF in the UK, Germany, and of course the rest of the world who are interested in comments and the content. We want to ensure that it is accessible for everybody after today's event. Finally, I want to encourage a vibrant and open participation today, and please ask us as many questions as you like. Before I hand over to David Hopkins from the TTF, I want to uh, make a quick general statement. When we came out of the last economic crisis in 2008-2009, green investments generated the highest returns in the recovery from the recession. As we restart our economy now after the COVID-19 crisis, there are many people that say we should commit again to investment in low carbon infrastructure, which will also help the UK to meet its net zero carbon target by 2050. The government also has another target which it, which it wants to meet by 2050, and that is to build 3.5 million new homes to tackle the housing crisis in the UK. This should be the perfect opportunity for modern construction methods and sustainable building materials to be used even more going forward. And many believe cross-laminated timber or CLT can be one solution. I would now like to introduce our co-host of today, David Hopkins, who is the chief, ex chief executive of the Timber Trade Federation in the UK. Uh, good morning, David. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Alex. And thank you for the opportunity um, to, to host this debate. I'll keep this uh, mercifully short. Um, I represent the Timber Trade Federation in the UK. As an organisation, we represent all timber products and we, we think they have a vital role to play in, in the built environment. And right now, just as Alex has said, I think um, the, the UK in particular faces uh, a big problem of uh, recovery from COVID, but also then the ongoing problems of meeting our construction needs in housing and other markets and also then achieving our net zero goals. We believe that the timber industry and timber products have a massive role to play in achieving both. In particular, the off-site methodologies that are, are coming through and need a great deal of support. And if, if, they're, if they're gonna really stick in the, in the construction economy, they can speed up delivery, they can speed up quality of build. Timber is a great material to be used in those off-site methodologies. Uh, and CLT is obviously at the forefront of all of that. I think it can not only just uh, speed up the delivery of construction, speed up um, and improve the quality of construction, but timber has a great role to play in reducing emissions, not just from uh, the, the final building, but throughout the entire supply chain that it operates in. We've done numerous life cycle assessment studies as an industry, 
to show that. I won't bore you with all of the details and all the facts and figures, but I'm more than happy to engage with anybody afterwards uh, to, to send through some of the, the case studies that have been shown. It has a huge uh, role to play, but the current consultation that is going on and the way that it's phrased and the assumptions that it makes are a major hindrance to achieving that. And I think that uh, a clearer and fairer debate about the role of timber in all manner of construction going forward is, a, is vital if we're gonna meet our targets. So uh, I'm gonna leave it there. I'm gonna hand over now uh, back to, uh, to Richard Ogden and, uh, and I look forward to any questions that, uh, that people may put forward. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, just to add my good morning to everybody and thank you for joining us. Uh, we've got a great expert round table. You've heard from one of them just now. And I'd just like to say a little bit uh, by way of introduction about myself. Um, I'm lucky enough to be your moderator for today. Thank you, Alex, for asking me. And I've spent about 30 plus years in the manufactured building sector. I've been both client, manufacturer, shareholder and advisor. I spent much of my time working globally in the UK, Europe, US, South America, Japan and China. It was an amazing journey and still is an amazing journey. And it culminated in building buildings in 48 hours. And yes, I did say hours. I didn't say weeks and days and months. But that was in the last century. We know, we all know that factory build is the right way. And I think it's even more appropriate in these horrible times we find ourselves in today in COVID-19, which I believe will help the trajectory even more using safer manufactured controlled environment, be they timber, be they wood, be they whatever. It's a controlled environment that we're looking for. And as David said, it's that off-site off methodology and the manufactured techniques using digital technology that will take us forward. The day of the tape measure is long since past. Today we haven't got a lot of time. This was going to be a half day session, but uh, force majeure needs must. So we've, we've made it into a one hour succinct session. So your, your replies and your questions need to be succinct as well. Now, how you do that, I have no idea, but luckily Alex Altman has agreed to control the process using the Zoom technology. So thank you for that, Alex. So let's move on without more ado to our expert panel. They are an expert panel. I'll let them introduce themselves and describe what's important to them in less than five minutes each. So if I can point the finger at uh, Alex, he's next on my list. So Alex, Alex Hughes, say a little bit about yourself and the things that excite you, why you get up in the morning. Good morning everybody, uh, nice to meet you all. Thank you Richard, thank you all. Um, yeah, my name's Alex Hughes, um, I'm the director of DFMA uh, with HTA Design. Uh, DFMA, uh, one of those acronyms uh, being bounded around, stands for Design for Manufacture and Assembly. Um, maybe some of you know uh, that term, uh, but I thought I'd spell it out because you know, there are lots of acronyms running around uh, like MMC, Modern Methods of Construction, um, and a whole myriad of others. Uh, I'm not here to talk about the acronyms. I'm here to talk about DFMA, um, uh, and which is really sort of, you know, my specialism, which I've developed over the last 20 years of experience uh, working as both an architect, but actually working as a specialist subcontractor for the most part, uh, working with some very interesting uh, materials and systems, um, ET starting with ETFE, uh, which is the uh, cladding system that is uh, used on the Eden project uh, down in Cornwall. I uh, started with that company uh, as we were developing that whole technology, uh, which is a, a 2D uh, platform-based technology uh, using aluminium uh, and, and ethotetrafluoroethylene. I can still remember what it stands for, another acronym. Um, I moved from that um, environment, uh, which was basically, as I say, working as a specialist subcontractor, also as a manufacturer, uh, we set up manufacturing facilities uh, in Germany, in Bremen, uh, and also in uh, just outside Beijing in China, um, and also as uh, 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 deliverers of projects. Uh, I really, uh, really learned how to become a project manager as opposed to an architect through this period. 
Uh, and then I moved uh, to a company called Urban uh, in, in London, here in the UK, uh, and was introduced to uh, cross laminated timber uh, systems. I uh, spent a few years uh, with those guys with sort of some very interesting uh, multi sector projects, uh, seven story uh, superstructure uh, buildings, residential projects, uh, and very much. Um, really really sort of le learnt a lot more about the process of uh, design for manufacture and assembly uh, and then took that forward uh, to um, a 3D volumetric CLT uh, modular system for New Build uh, and uh, SWAN the Housing Association uh, here in the southeast uh, where we where well really I took a lot of the the, the, the lessons learnt I think from the uh, the 2D platform work into the th sort of 3D volumetric uh, development work um, I'm here to talk about uh, DFMA, I'm here to talk about smart construction, um, I'm here to talk about uh, changes uh, really uh, and uh, that you know we, we change through learning lessons and I think there's you know a, a, an incredible amount of lessons that we need to be uh, learning right now and then uh, putting into sort of you know training and education. Um, I think I should stop there, I haven't got a timer. Very well done, thank you. Yeah one of the th thank you for that Alex. Um, there's no special order that the speakers are speaking in. Um, after the speakers are finished, we'll then move on to your questions and I'll describe uh, just before we start that and before Alex helps us get the questions from you and also the, the set piece questions as well. So could um, Dashiell go next then please and tell us a little bit about uh, why you get up in the morning. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm Dashiell Shah. I'm a material scientist at the Centre for Natural Material Innovation at Cambridge University's Department of Architecture. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, so I work at the center on natural materials, including timber and bamboo for building applications, but also a whole host of other interesting biomaterials like spider silks and looking at developing synthetic elephant ivory for elephant conservation, uh, as well as plant-based materials like natural fibers. Uh, hemp and flax composites. Um, our group has been working on timber construction for uh, over 10 years now. We started off doing uh, innovative research on looking at tall structures from timber, engineered timbers, this is, um, such as cross laminated timber as well as laminated veneer lumber, LVL, some more acronyms here, and glue lamb. Um, and these uh, research ideas were to look at what we need to know in the next five or ten years as to do with the materials, the processing, uh, and building a capacity to be able to build taller buildings uh, in the future, perhaps in 20 years or 50 years time. Uh, because firstly we need the resources, trees, uh, which we need to start uh, growing now rather than um, in 20 years time. Um, more recently, we have been doing projects on more urgent and immediately uh, important topics, such as looking at developing schools in the UK uh, and designing schools in the UK from uh, engineered timber materials, as well as looking at social housing and mid-rise housing in the South Asian market uh, in collaboration with uh, sawmills and uh, forest owners uh, in New Zealand. Um, we at the center work across length scale, so not only on the application side, looking at working with architecture and engineering firms to develop architecturally interesting buildings, as well as something that can be mass fabricated, uh, like the automotive industry perhaps, um, but also looking at the fundamental and basic science, how does wood actually get its interesting properties? What is the molecular architecture of wood, which we st still don't real really understand, as well as uh, looking at how we may be able to genetically modify, chemically modify, thermally or mechanically modify wood to make it more durable or have uh, more useful properties for uh, applications in the future beyond buildings even. Um, so that summarizes a range of things uh, that we do. I think uh, the key point I want to mention over here is wood is the only large-scale building material that we grow and it is renewable and therefore we need to be looking at it uh, as a solution for the future building industry, particularly because um, 
Currently, the construction and operation of buildings are responsible for approximately 40% of the UK's as well as global carbon footprint um, and the production of cement, steel and other building materials uh, with the wave of construction that is expected is going to be continue to be a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the question is, is it possible to transform this potential threat to the global climate system into a means to mitigate climate change? And we think that cross laminated timber as well as other engineered timber materials and their potential use in mid-rise urban buildings, but also schools and hospitals may provide long-term storage of carbon and thinking of buildings as a carbon sink. And this has been outlined uh, more recently by the joint report by the Royal Academy of Engineering and Royal Society commissioned by the UK government on greenhouse gas removal that recommended that to achieve net zero emissions in the UK by 2050, we need to encourage changes in building practice uh, to use wood. Um, and therefore, we are also now moving into research to inform policies of the future, apart from doing the material scale, component scale and application scale research that we already do. Uh, thank you, Richard. Yeah, just a little point there before we go to the next speaker, Deshul, if I could. Um, perhaps you might like to explain uh, to the audience what is CLT? We all love to use acronyms. Everybody thinks they know what the acronyms are and there'll be somebody nudging somebody now uh, across the bank of people saying, what's CLT? And so if you explain what is that we started using it in 2004, I believe, um, mm. with, at any sort of uh, rate, describe why it's different. What's, why is CLT, in your perception, why is it perceived to be as good as it is? CLT, why good? Well, CLT is an entirely different product, something that you would not be able to buy at a local DIY store, for example. It's what it is an engineered timber product that was classed as uh, useful for mass timber construction rather than timber frame, timber frame or stick frame construction in which you would just use posts and um, sticks. In this case, you have uh, large sections of uh, sawn timber that are glued and laminated and compressed in very specific 090 orientations that make it dimensionally stable. They are uh, 1.2 meters uh, wide and they can be uh, significantly longer as well. Um, and uh, there's a slide that has come up and you can see uh, through this slide that apart from just making MDF or uh, even sawn timber, you can get a whole host of other engineered timber products which can be used and bespokely digitally manufactured uh, to form walls, roofs, um, with the advantages of uh, off-site prefabrication and then bringing in modules, reducing truck deliveries, uh, as well as uh, erecting buildings very quickly with a uh, fewer number of people uh, on the site and reduce truck deliveries. So cross-laminated timber and engineered timber products are an entirely different product and they enable a completely different form of manufacturing method which is crucial for the future industry um, for of building and construction. Uh, and I'm sure Nick will be able to uh, and others in our panel will be able to share some more light on cross-laminated timber as well. Yeah, some of the things, thank you for that. I hope that helped one or two of the guys in the audience uh, to understand a little bit more about it. But I think also you talked about helping the off-site construction and reduce the man hours and the waste on site. Also it goes to the heart of, so, of um, social distancing as well, which I think um, we're rapidly, that's going to be some of the future, uh, a big part of the future. We know not how much, but it's going to be a big part of the future. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for your explanation. I hope that's easier. So um, let's move on to Nick. Now, Nick told me that he'd been involved in his, uh, in his lifespan of putting together 300 buildings in, in this particular sector. So tell us why you get up in the morning, Nick. Um, thank you, Richard. Um, well, I've been, been lucky enough to enter a phase of my career now um, working for KLH. Um, which really um, has been the most rewarding part of the career that I've had in construction to date. I've been in construction for 30 years, 
Um, that doesn't mean I started at the age of 10, just in case anyone's concerned about my youthful looks. Um, but, it's, uh, so, but it's been an incredibly rewarding time on the basis of really believing in the product. And I think that's, I think the fundamental driver for me getting out of bed in the morning, Richard, is that I believe in cross-laminated timber. Um, I believe massively also in the concept of value over cost. And I think that as project teams across the UK, we miss that concept massively. Look at the holistic position of the building from capital cost to operational cost um, and all of the value that cross-laminated timber can bring to that. Um, I think the, also the off-site manufacturing process drives a much more collaborative uh, team environment as well. We see a lot more two-stage tendering, which is good, and therefore we can add value at design um, through collaboration with the other design team members, which I think is incredibly important, again, for really sucking out the value of the project. Um, and recently, I think, you know, obviously the post Grenfell uh, world that we live in has heightened the need for us to engage with stakeholders um, a lot more and to understand their fears and concerns and to try and remove all barriers to entry into the market for cross-laminated timber. And in doing so, we naturally improve our governance, which I think is important. Um, any modern method of construction um, is rarely complacent. Um, but I think, you know, we need to be on our toes and we need to improve our governance every step of the way. And in, we, and in doing so, you know, we'll win the hearts and minds of, of everyone, not just stakeholders, but the public as well, who will ultimately be moving into those homes that we build for them. So just to pick up on Darshil's comments there about CLT, cross-laminated timber, the, the actual manufacturing capabilities um, are, are such that we are producing panels at 16 meters long and um, three meters wide, sometimes in addition to three meters wide. The transportation restrictions um, generally limit us to articulated vehicles, which um, chunk that down to 13 and a half meters in length. Um, and yeah, the social distancing thing is an interesting uh, addition to the mix. You know, we, we see a lot less deliveries um, to a construction site by using cross laminated timber compared to traditional materials. So, you know, the air quality improvements um, are obvious and also, you know, safety to uh, road users, particularly cyclists, is obviously benefited by that. Um, and our crew sizes typically are about four or five per hook. So we operate obviously everything off the crane um, with crew sizes typically between four and five. And if you compare that to a reinforced concrete uh, frame, you'll probably see sort of 30 guys on a site compared to our five. So from a social distancing point of view, yeah, that's a major advantage. So yeah, I'll leave it there, I'm conscious of time, but thank you, Richard. Thank you, you're all doing very well so far. You all kept uh, right to time, which is fantastic. We're running at uh, 25 minutes, We've got 35 minutes yet to go, which is good, so thank you. Before I introduce Terry next, um, uh, Terry's going to talk about the, uh, the sort of importance of assurance and all the things that make the use of what people call alternative materials, uh, using your terminology, not mine, modern methods of construction, I prefer smart construction, um, available in the future. So. Terry, explain your experiences and why Bopass and why Lloyd's and why everything and why did you get up this morning? Okay. Um, thanks, uh, Richard, uh, and good morning. Yeah, my, my name's Terry Mundy. Um, I'm a, a chartered engineer and uh, my background is actually in um, nuclear engineering. <clears throat> and I got involved with uh, the offsite sector uh, about 15 years ago. Um, and uh, my aim uh, and my introduction really to the offsite sector was um, in part to introduce some of the assurance processes that existed within the nuclear sector into the offsite sector. Um, and to that end, um, 
I was involved in the development of uh, the Build Offsite Property Assurance Scheme. Um, as the name suggests, it's an assurance scheme that provides confidence to uh, lenders that the um, offsite system has the durability and um, integrity uh, that will meet their requirements in terms of uh, it, to provide mortgages and, and equally importantly it's to provide a high degree of certainty to accredited off-site providers and their developers that mortgageability will be forthcoming. Um, it was developed in the era of the sort of immediate post 2008 recession uh, in order that um, off-site providers could access the um, marketplace because at that point in time lenders were very risk averse and wouldn't lend against anything that didn't have a track record and by definition non-traditional innovative off-site systems didn't necessarily have that track record mm -hmm. but more than that um, if off-site systems weren't allowed into the marketplace in any significant way then there was no way that at that stage we could meet the sustainable codes which were introduced by the Labour government in about 2007 uh, with a view to implementation in 2013 and 16 for public and private sector properties. Um, and of course at that stage we didn't know that they would be scrapped. But um, And so the partners, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, Build Off Site, Lloyd's Register and Building Life Plans got together recognising the problem and developed a concept which we presented to the uh, Council of Mortgage Lenders uh, identifying what our perception of the issues were. They, they acknowledged and recognised those and then put together a um, working group comprising the partners and the principal lenders um, in order to develop an assurance process, building on the concept that we brought to the table. And the output after about an 18 month period was uh, BOPAS, um, which comprised um, a durability assessment and maintainability assessment performed by building life plans and a process accreditation uh, which was delivered by Lloyd's Register. In other words, a validation of the construction system and a validation of the um, means of delivery from design through manufacture to construction in order to minimize the possibility of um, systemic failure, which was always, of course, a nightmare for, for lenders. Um, we have subsequently uh, accredited up to 80 companies, about 15% of which are CLT, um, have CLT in their construction system. And we have also evaluated CLT suppliers as well. Um, unfortunately, of course, uh, there are a number which are moving out of CLT now simply on the basis of the 18 meter uh, constraint. Um, but, um, it's still a significant force within the, the UK offsite construction sector. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Terry. Um, whenever you start a small step towards something as dramatic as this, it always takes a lot of time because you've got all the, all the other players around the world uh, who've got a vested interest in keeping what they've got. So what we set out to here with Terry and others is to try and have what you might call a global standard over time, because a lot of the things that we're doing here have the same relevance uh, as they do in other parts of the world. And uh, it's the closing down of those standards which we think are important to get that quality that you need throughout. And uh, also the service safety as well, quality safety uh, of the final item, which is what people look for. And especially if they're looking for mortgages or they want banks to, to loan. So it's a pretty important thing, we think. So thanks, Harry. Thanks for that. Now we'll move on to Marco. We're doing again. Splendid on time. Marco, I think you've got a slide, haven't you, Marco? Yes. Where's he gone? Here he goes. I think Alex has to slide. Um, <laughs> pop up in a second. Um, I'm getting up in the morning because I feel, being an engineer in the construction industry, we have currently a huge opportunity to really make an impact and we have an answer on many challenges we, we face today, especially when it comes to sustainability. And I'm personally heading the engineering department um, in the UK for Trace and Summer. And Trace and Summer is a global consultancy, engineering and project management firm. And one of our core initiatives 
is cradle to cradle, and that's driven by circular economy. So our mission is really to help project teams at the transition from the current uh, linear economy you see on the left side, um, from our take make waste society towards a circular economy where we can keep raw materials in a loop so that a building has multiple lives. And we are very, very convinced that cradle to cradle circular economy will bring the next revolution to the construction industry because it solves nearly all sustainability problems. It solves the waste problem. To consider that in the UK, 60% of the waste is related to the construction sector. It solves also our raw material um, problem. Um, it improves health in our buildings and it reduces carbon, especially embodied carbon, which is so hard to reduce. I think Darish mentioned that already before. And wood or timber is a key material when it comes to circular economy. It's part of the biological cycle we use. And in that biological cycle, we, we want to use plant-based materials to produce goods which can and products which can go back to nature through biodegradation. And when it now comes to timber solution, or when it comes to timber, um, the solution is really to, to keep the timber in our product, product life cycle as, as long as possible. So there are cascade systems um, which help us to do so. And one of the projects we currently work on is the cradle in, in Germany. And here we use um, circular timber products. We have we use solid wood floor slabs instead of concrete. And we have a reversible um, timber um, structure on the exterior and we use um, reversible timber wall panels. And that building in the end can then di be disassembled at the end of the life cycle and the materials, they can be reused, they can be recycled for a new life of a new building. And I would say wood obviously has a great potential regarding sustainability, but it really depends how we use and process the wood in our projects. Is that it finished? Yes. <laughs> okay, it's a bit of an abrupt end, sorry about that. Um, yeah, you've both mentioned some, both you and Marco have mentioned something I think is quite interesting, which I think I'll try and amplify, uh, Marco and Alex Hughes that is. You've talked about a future use of a building and reuse, mm -hmm. and we never, we never have that in existing buildings. We knock building down, buildings down, we grind them to pulp, and then we call that sustainability. If we're using um, smart construction, we are very able to disassemble. And I think this is part and parcel of something we haven't seen. We experimented back in the day in last century doing it. And it's very, very doable and it can save huge amounts of money. But there seems to be a natural reluctance towards it. So I think that's something for the, the 21st century with some of the modern outlooks from some of the uh, younger people on the screen at the moment looking forward to that opportunity in a sustainable way because I think that's a huge uh, tip in the box for sustainability. So thank you for bringing that up uh, Mark, I appreciate that. So we've, you've all uh, done a fantastic job, all of you, thank you for that. So what we're going to do now, we're going to move on to the questions and the reason we're asking these questions, we're having the conference is because we'd like to put a paper together for government and this answers one of the questions that came through on the chat line. Why is there a difference between the UK, UK government? Why don't the UK government fall in line with Europe under regs for timber? And what Terry was talking about earlier with the 18 meter freeze on maximum height. So that's, that's a key to what we're doing today. Why are we doing this event? Um, We'd like a common playing field for all materials, the ones that we know and the ones that we don't know. Some of the new ones that you were talking about, Dashiell, like timber, bamboo, and other materials that are, are not on our general radar at the moment, and perhaps they should be and could be. So my real question is, why CLT? And then equally, why not? And timber to me is a material for construction it is not the material for construction it's this hybrid opportunity which i think is where we should be looking there's more value in hybrids than there is in saying 
it must be all steel, it must be all timber, it must be whatever you want to put against it. So one of the questions I hope, I hope it occurs during this session today is we need to know the timber sweet spots. What are the sweet spots of timber? Where do they fit best in this little puzzle that we have in front of us? And as, as I said before, it's not just about housing, it's about housing, residential, and all buildings, big and small, high and low. So with that, we'll start some questions going if we can. Are you okay with that, Alex? Where's Alex, the leader? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you're okay, good. Um, so you're controlling the buttons now, yeah? <laughs> Excellent, good. So first question is, um, Marco, you had a question in relation to wood and the pragmatic use of wood against carbon emissions. How do, you, how do you sell that to a client? How does the client, how does, he, how does he receive that when you're talking to him about that? Is that top of his box or is it number 11 off a 10 point agenda? Well, I think the topic um, carbon is on, on, on the top of the sustainability agenda of, of all investors right now. Everyone is producing zero carbon um, buildings. Um, what we often neglect is that half of the carbon is um, embodied in materials we use. And most of the zero carbon buildings we currently see on the market are only addressing the operational side. So we only tell half the truth. And um, so we try to really um, take that to, to our clients. And um, the, I think the challenge is then on the material side, how to reduce it. And um, so you need an architect who, who is really committing himself to work on that. And I think timber here plays a huge solution because I think one cubic meter of timber can store 250 kilograms of, of carbon. With a timber solution, you can turn a building into a carbon sink and then the project can, come, can become climate positive. So you're not only a, a zero carbon building, you can have a building which has a positive impact. And I think not all clients um, understand that and are willing to invest in that, but all clients with a very strong aspiration regarding sustainability and they want to have an honest approach to zero carbon and that includes embodied carbon as well. Okay, thank you. What I'd like to do, Alex, with your agreement is can we take, can we go from a, uh, a question that we have here and also a question from the audience and mix and match it? Is that possible? Absolutely. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. I've um, got a question here from Kim Verno to everybody. One of the barriers in the UK for CLT in particular remains the attitude of latent defects insurers who remain wary of this material in part because of the water damage that can arise when it is not erected properly, and further, what the requirements post Grenfell will be vis-a-vis -vis high rise timber buildings. What might the panel's view be? Do you want to start with that, Dashiell? Do, do a quick one, I'll try and get to a couple of you as well. Sure, yeah, I think uh, there are lots of design methods you could use to prevent water damage, and I think this is in part how you would work with the product manufacturer as well as with an architect and engineering firm to make sure you're meeting the design requirements. So for example, you would not have timber exposed uh, in the first floor. It would be above a certain height, especially so that water ingress, especially from the end grains, uh, that's what you need to um, look out for um, in particular. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I think I will pass on to anyone else who wants to add anything. Yeah, anybody else next? Nick? Uh, yeah, thank you, Richard. I'll take that one, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good question, Kim. Um, you know, we've been working um, as part of our involvement with the Structural Timber Association on looking at durability designs, and I think you know, it's very right that we look at water um, or moisture as a risk to CLT in the same way as people talk about fire. Um, and we've got options we've developed a, um, guidance on design which you know picks up on you know uh, those areas where the timber could be vulnerable and looks at robust design um, so that's for the permanent solution we also need to consider uh, moisture during the uh, construction process and again we've got um, moisture management plans that we can share with the contractors 
So between the subcontractor and the main contractor, we keep the building in good shape. And there's a mixture of sort of management and surface treatments that can be applied in grain sears and that sort of thing um, during construction. Um, so that combined with the good designs um, to ensure the timber remains robust and in the service classes that it's intended to um, should give some assurances to the um, insurance companies. Um, but what I'd also do is I challenge the insurers to become uh, more proactive in these um, areas and the same with regard to the post Grenfell fire situations. Obviously we need to go through some uh, testing and um, demonstrate to government that our product can perform um, from a life safety and also I guess an asset protection basis. Once we've got those um, in place I would encourage the insurers to um, offer insurance but predicated on conditions that need to be met by the um, contractors and, and take a, an active role in visiting sites to ensure that those um, designs are, are carried out effectively um, to make sure that all of the necessary fire safety components are installed where they should be and ensure, um, installed correctly. Um, and there where we get extra governance into that whole construction process, I think. Um, we know what good design looks like, but we don't necessarily always see that good design um, being carried out on site through good workmanship. Yeah, but isn't that part of uh, part of the the issue, Nick, to to make sure that more and more and more and more is done in the factory, and we don't have people going to site? Um, this idea of going we, when we build anything that's not a construction site, we don't send people there. It's already pre-checked, and I think we must work more and more, especially in the COVID, in the post-COVID times, um, to try and find ways of doing that rather than this constant thinking, we have to go to the site of work. That's the worst place we can possibly go to because it's not controlled in the way that we would want it to control, uh, to be controlled. I would agree with that. Uh, yeah, absolutely, because you're, that would be an ultimate, but don't let perfect get in the way of good. And we've still got an awful lot of panelized construction methodologies into the UK where a certain degree of on-site um, governance is required. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And of course, water management during the construction process is going to is going to be an issue, whether it's volumetric or panelised. Yeah. Do you have an insurer's point on that, Terry? That you want to raise, Terry? But there, there have been a number of problems with uh, water ingress uh, in CLT, and um, what we've sought to do within the uh, scheme is to as Nick mentioned, introduce moisture control plans, but beyond that also ensure that um, design failure mode effect analysis and production failure mode effect analysis are very comprehensive. And um, it's one of the benefits of the scheme really, I suppose, insofar as we can learn from the problems from one organization and ensure that they're not repeated in any of the other organizations which we evaluate and accredit. Yeah, good. Okay, moving on. We've got another quarter of an hour left. Time is moving quite rapidly. Um, I can't see you on the screen, Alex. I can see Alex Altman. I can't see Alex Hughes. Are you still there? I think he's muted. Okay, right. Uh, yeah, I'm I was still going to ask. Yeah. yeah, he's still there. Good. Okay, thank you. Now, the question which I'd, I'd like you to um, uh, comment on, please. Uh, from Harry, uh, Harry Sherbrooke. It would be good to hear from the panel their thoughts on how to best insulate CLT buildings and share how M&E are best handled in such buildings. Okay, that's an interesting one. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll split them. I'll, I'll just talk about the insulation one first briefly. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's some issues there with regards to current um, uh, standard requirements, uh, uh, you know, particularly in the, in the current building regulations. Uh, you know, we can get very focused on particular aspects of performance, particularly post uh, quite traumatic events, uh, and can then sort of, you know, as a result, lose sight of, uh, you know, other uh, other issues that really need uh, consideration, and maybe more, more, more importantly, and more critically, uh, so for example, climate change, uh, and, uh, you know, how we, how we currently insulate buildings, and, uh, 
uh, um, you know, manage that is really based on a, a different type of mindset and a different type of thinking, uh, which was, you know, from about 30 or 40 years ago, post, post oil crisis, uh, and was uh, really based on a need to sort of, you know, conserve and, and keep everything in, uh, which was as much a response to the very poor quality of work uh, that's been produced uh, traditionally, and, and whether that's actually got any better or not is arguable. Um, you know, you end up putting large amounts of insulation on sort of CLT, which is actually when it's put together because of its, uh, uh, because of its uh, manufactured uh, nature uh, and its, uh, uh, you know, characteristics can be, uh, you know, put together very, uh, with uh, minimal air escape. Uh, so it's actually retaining a lot of, uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the temperature inside, uh, you know, and, and it can cause all manner of problems, uh, let alone actually trying to apply external uh, cladding systems through very high layers of uh, um, uh, build up of insulation and and then breather membranes uh, uh, and then the problems that 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 in itself causes with potentially with regards durability um, uh, so you know I, I think there are lots of questions there but but they've all almost been sort of si slightly sidelined in in the in the discussion about performance uh, in fire really which uh, is is in my opinion a bit of a misnomer uh, but, but but there we go. Uh, so the other part of the question, um, I, I just I just wanted to talk about uh, uh, sort of mindset uh, again, really here, because um, you know, uh, with regards to M and E, uh, one of the you know one of the key things about what, when you use a, a system like C CLT is the very early coordination that's required by uh, uh, you know building services, uh, structural engineering, but building services in particular. Because the uh, builders' work holes basically uh, are, are should be being cut into the CLT panel prior to uh, prior to its actual uh, delivery to site, uh, so that requires a much earlier level of engagement uh, uh, by the design consultants and the technical specialists in particular uh, to get all that figured out uh, and to get that uh, uh, built into the uh, uh, the the, uh, the engineering and the modelling uh, in order that it can be coordinated and cut into the panels prior to them being uh, manufactured, prior to them being delivered. Um, so this is a different mindset. And just uh, Marco's slide was quite interesting, I think, because, you know, mindset is to do with how we've moved already from a linear economy into a, a recyclable economy, uh, 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 mindset uh, and economy. I mean, you know, I always use that as an analogy of what is mindset. Well, you know, 50 years ago, we didn't used to recycle materials, but now we do. We all actually do that ourselves individually. We do it without a request for payment. We actually sort it into different types before we actually go and put it out to be collected. Uh, you know, that was a, that was a big mindset uh, change. And, you know, we need to move to a new mindset change about how we actually uh, approach a building and design uh, in, in a similar way. I mean, circular economy, uh, but also just in terms of how you approach design design uh, and design for manufacture and assembly or, or as I actually prefer to call it uh, you know design which is production friendly uh, uh, but also user friendly as well um, and, and you know and, and I mean that in the long term with regards disassembly uh, as well as, uh, as you know Nick, Nick and others mentioned um, you know it's about learning lessons uh, you know we went through a very thorough process as I know Nick will have been as well at KLH with uh, uh, BOPASS and the uh, accreditation system, uh, which we went through at New Build, uh, you know, and, and that was really very much again ba based on embedding a, a mindset of learning lessons, okay, and that you know this is how this is how we innovate, this is how we continuously improve, um, you know, but 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 within within the offsite manufacturing sector, there are these inherent qualities which were already there anyway, but which we we, we can maybe sort of highlight better now about to do with things like safety. Uh, to do with predictability, uh, to do with obviously sustainability, uh, uh, you know, other key headings I've got here, resilience, both in terms of desi in design and in use, uh, and, uh, and also, uh, you know, that all of this is with a, a quality assurance uh, that, that, you know, what will be being delivered will be delivered on time and will be of the quality uh, as, as required. Uh, you know, and this is real value, real, as Nick said earlier from KLH, is, you know, this is where design becomes real value add uh, uh, rather than something to be value engineered. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and really that everybody loses, if you like, the connection between the vision uh, of the design and the actual building and what is delivered at the end but then also what then happens if you like post occupancy evaluation stage with what more lessons can we learn uh, to feed back into the in, into the next uh, iterations in the design process okay alex thank you 
Does um, uh, any of the other panel want to have a succinct comment back on anything that Alex said? If not, I've got four more minutes left, and then I'll pass back to Alex for questions and wrap up. Um, uh, any, anybody got a, a thought they want to add to that? Uh, just in terms of the lessons learned that Alex made reference to, uh, I think that's one of the major distinctions between off-site and traditional build insofar as everything on traditional build is largely subbed out. And so therefore, in terms of lessons learned, it's an open loop. Whereas with, within the offsite sector, it tends to be uh, staff employed to do, undertaking most of the activities. And so therefore, it, there is the opportunity for, there is a closed loop, there is the opportunity for lessons learned, continuous improvement and um, uh, informing risk going forward so you, you can demonstrate that ongoing continuous improvement and, and that's i think one of the major distinctions between the two types of construction besides of course sustainability issues thank you for that addition there terry uh Dashiell, i'd like you've got a question and i've got one back from the audience as well um the perceived and i use that word correctly perceived challenges with clt construction as brief as you can, please, in the last few minutes. Sure. Uh, I think some of the perceived challenges are to do with uh, the UK currently not being a, not having a lot of its own forest area, so having to um, import a lot of uh, timber products or timber itself. In fact, the UK is the world's second biggest importer of wood um, and wood products. Um, so an aspect would be to do with that and. Uh, I suppose in the near future, if we are to construct more timber buildings or CLT buildings, um, perhaps a lot of the manufacturing of the CLT will need to be, or similar engineered products would have to be done in the UK itself. I think uh, 30 to 40 percent of the value of, C, uh, of the engineered timber products lies in the manufacturing. Um, so there are questions to do with trade deficits as well as what happens after Brexit that need to be looked at, um, and that's one of the uh, and associated labour shortages could be one of the challenges as well. However, in comparison to other methods of construction, such as with um, traditional steel or reinforced concrete, as we mentioned before, um, on-site manufacturing uh, you need fewer number of people on-site and workers. So, with social distancing in place, that will um, be less of a challenge. But I think. Uh, there also needs to be a larger discussion about testing and about um, uh, having a coherent global policy on this as well. Because, for example, while the UK is considering uh, having a ban of on combustible materials above 18 meters, possibly 11 meters, the local government in Paris for keeping the Olympics 2024 in mind have mandated that any building above eight meters uh, above eight stories should be built primarily in Tim. Uh, so we see some of these very contradictory uh, policies in place. Uh, and I think there needs to be a more coherent discussion about that as well. Okay. Uh, uh, we've got time for another question, Alex, or are we? Yes, yeah. Yep. Yeah, right. um, yeah, I, I won't let uh, Terry run on this one, but part of what you were alluding to there in your last piece, Nashua, was the reason we started uh, BOPAS was because we wanted a global brand, the Lloyd's Register, an internationalization, rather than the flag waving that goes on around the world. Uh, the fire or anything you want to mention in the UK is the same as the fire in, in France, it's the same as the fire in Germany and the same in America. And this is where this stupidity sets in because it's been allowed to go on for so long. So that's where we wanted to break step. And these are the baby steps we've been doing with Terry over the last 15 years to move that on into something that has real stature with a real name, not by a country by country nature. We're interested looking after 7.7 .7 billion people, not just 67, people in the UK, 67 million people in the UK. They're all equally important. And I think that's where uh, people like your good selves uh, the august universities can bring about um, that challenge and that change because people will listen to you, which is good. 
Okay, another question then from Tab Binding. Is there a place for timber in external structural wall buildups above 11 meters and below 18 meters in the UK? And is BS 8414 the right test for timber as an external structural wall? Maybe Any that's a question for David Hopkins. Yeah, David, sorry, I didn't say what, David. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I can do that. Um, I, th I think other people will, will have a, uh, a better answer on the 8414 test. As I understood it, it's a cladding test, not a, a structural wall test. There is definitely a place for timber in the structural wall. And ha our whole lobbying position has been to say, particularly with this consultation, there is a difference between the cladding and the structural wall, and therefore they should not be treated the same in uh, the proposed combustibles ban. Uh, the, the consultation as it stands, I think suffers from mission creep, and it, it started off as a response to, or a, uh, a, an, an effort to, to introduce a, a kind of a tough line on cladding after the Grenfell disaster. That's fine, but if you're gonna talk about cladding, talk about cladding. The consultation then moves into the structural wall itself. And we saw that as, as a separate thing. I'm, I'm not disputing that it may need to be discussed, it may need to be reviewed, but we should not confuse the two things. So um, we, we still think that the BS8414 test is good for, for cladding uh, on an external wall, but the structural wall needs to be treated separately and differently. I'll leave it at that. Someone else may have yeah, a more yeah, technical yeah. view. Anybody got a comment on that? Anybody on the panel? No? You're looking very quiet. You've gone quiet on me. <laughs> you want to go back to bed. So we're coming up to the, uh, we're coming up to the end. No, you've got one there. Nick, are you coming in? Well, I would, I would support what David has said there, you know, the 8414 is a, a cladding test um, and, and really the, the post Grenfell reaction to structural timber is, feels um, unjust, I'd say. But I also think that there is, you know, we should be conscious of what the Hackett report came back with about a general heightened amount of governance that we put into our buildings um, and the behaviours that sit behind that as well. Um, I don't think that the Grenfell situation particularly was about material. Obviously, that played a major part, but there was a lot about behaviours that sit behind why that material was used that needs to be driven out of the construction industry. Um, so I think that there is a place for CLT in external walls um, in, uh, of those taller buildings, but I think that needs to be done on the basis of performance testing, and that performance testing should apply to any material um, existing or any um, innovative material that arrives um, in 2020 or 2021. There needs to be a place to prove your material can perform um, in all of those criteria. I think just to add to that, Nick, and your colleague Dashiell, uh, Michael Rummage, a uh, very interesting 10-minute um, vignette, I think it was, that uh, he put out on high-rise buildings and lumber and all those things which gave a very good broader view 10 minutes worth uh, in a very easy to understand which presumably uh, you're fully au fait with so according to my clock it's 12 o'clock um uh, what do you want to do now so we're going to close it down can i just say yeah. uh, two sentences yeah absolutely go ahead Richard. yeah well i I'd, I'd like to say thank you very much to the panel uh, i think we've had um in difficult circumstances, this is not as we would have wished. As I said before, we'd much prefer the interaction of a, a big audience. That can't happen today, I'm afraid, but perhaps in the future we can look towards that. This, this was, um, I think, a very good effort put together. Um, we managed to cover a lot in an hour. And I'd just like to finish with one short, succinct statement. We should never waste a crisis. This is a crisis, and I think if we start thinking differently from this, it could reflect on a lot of the things we did, uh, we will be doing in the future. And remember in, in terms of uh, severe hardship, uh, and I'll just mention something that's a great love of mine, the Mosquito aeroplane that was built in, in the 1940s by de Havilland. It was known as the wooden wonder because we had no steel. 
it was known as the finest, most maneuverable aeroplane in the skies. And that was built in timber. And it was hugely fast. It was faster than the average plane. It did things that no other planes did. We did it because we had to do it as opposed to wanting to do it. And perhaps that, that mandate will now change going forward. So I hope so anyway. So thank you for allowing me uh, to be your moderator and thank you for your in insightful answers. I'd just like to thank you and thank the audience for listening and pass back to Alex. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Richard, for uh, moderating the event today. Thank you for participating today. I hope you enjoyed the discussions of our experts. Uh, the webinar has been recorded and will be available on the Chamber's website this afternoon. Uh, I hope to see you at one of our next webinars and uh, keep well. Bye for now.